Good evening, everyone. My name is John Clagora. Uh, I am a North Fulton County, Georgia Master Gardener, and I would like to welcome you to this evening's presentation on lawn care for fall and winter in the Atlanta area. Uh, before we get started, I would like to mention a, a few things. Uh, there is a handout that goes with this, uh, with this presentation. I hope you all have downloaded that handout. It'll make it easier for, the, for you to follow through the presentation and you won't have to take any notes while you're go, going. Uh, and if you would like to enter any questions, please do so at, as we go through the presentation. We will taking a break midway through the presentation to answer questions as well as at the end of the presentation. Your lawn is the biggest investment that you have in your entire landscape because, because of the amount of time and effort that you spend on your lawn, whether it's you or a lawn service throughout almost the entire year, your landscape really costs you more money than anything else on your property. Uh, the objective of this class is to provide effective, practical information so you can have an attractive lawn. We will explain what to do and when to do it. When your lawn is attractive, your house and the rest of your landscaping really, really stands out. We offer this fall, this class in the fall because in North Georgia, we have both warm season grasses and cool season grasses. And many of you will have both of those on your property. And each one is treated differently at this time of the year in particular, uh, which I will explain as we go th through the presentation. Uh, early next spring, we also offer a class on lawn care for spring and summer. So they're sort of companion classes because of the fact that we have the two different types of, of grasses in our area. Uh, I've been dealing with lawns for many, many years. I've always tended my own lawn and I enjoy lawns as well as other parts of my, uh, my landscape. We're gonna be talking tonight about warm season grasses and what their characteristics are, cool season grasses, uh, the importance of soil testing. At this point, we will take a break and then we'll go on to fertilizing, watering, and weed prevention, various activities, a wrap up of the various activities that each of you have to do in the fall and the winter, and then go over resources that you can access for, for additional information. Before I get started, however, I want to mention that all grasses need sun, water, and nutrients. Sun is extremely important because all grasses need at least four hours of sun every day. Depending upon when you have sun on your property will really determine the type of grass that you have. All grass needs water, but the amount of water really depends upon the variety. Uh, you also need good drainage because grasses don't like soggy, wet, damp soil. And finally, all grass needs nutrients. We, we all know that uh, we need to be applying fertilizer to our lawns. We mow them every week. And that forces them to grow more. And that's really the reason why we have to add fertilizer throughout the growing period. But in order for that fertilizer to be absorbed by the plant's roots, we really need to have the proper soil chemistry as well. So we'll be talking about that uh, uh, later on. If you look at this list, you can control the nutrients that your lawn gets. You can control through irrigation the amount of water your lawn gets. But you really can't control the amount of sun unless you're willing to cut down a lot of trees. So sun is the primary ingredient when you get it and how long it lasts that's going to determine the type of grass that does best on your property. So now let's go into warm season grasses. 
In the North Georgia, that consists of hybrid Bermuda and Zoysia. Those, those 99% of you will have one or the other if you've got a warm season grass. Warm season grasses love it when the temperature is between 80 and 95 degrees. And they also love full, full sun. As most of us know, these grasses are dormant during cold weather in Georgia. And so they're straw colored when they're, when they're dormant. They're not dead. They're just sleeping, uh, uh, waiting for the temperature to warm up for them. They only grow in the southern part of the United States. So if you're a northerner, northerner we didn't have those up when, when we lived in the north. Uh, Bermuda and Zoysia are established using sod. You don't seed the lawn to get these. The good thing about them is if we do have a drought, they are drought tolerant after they are established. They want water, but they can handle dryness. Let's take a look, look, look at the annual cycle then for uh, warm season grass. Uh, in the beginning of the year, you, you look at the chart and for January, February, and March, you, you can see that the grass is dormant. It's straw colored. But starting around the middle of April and extending until the middle of May, the grass starts to green up. Green up. And as it does this, it just becomes splotchy green to begin with, little bits of it green. But generally by the middle of May, all of our lawn is, has turned green and it is actively growing. So now we are in that growth spurt, which continues really unabated until the end of September, beginning of October, as the days get a little shorter and the, and the temperatures start to go down, uh, our grasses, our warm season grasses sense this. Uh, they know they've got to slow down themselves, so that they start turning uh, straw colored. And generally by the middle of November, they're totally dormant and they'll remain that way until next, uh, the following April. Uh, the dominant Bermuda grass that you will find is called Piffway. Mo most of us just ca call it the common hybrid Bermuda. Uh, Tiffway needs full sun, a minimum of six hours of sun, and not sun from eight o'clock in the morning until two o'clock in the afternoon. It wants sun at the hottest part of the day. So it really needs sun from 11 o'clock in the morning until five o'clock in the afternoon. And if it has sun from eight o'clock in the morning until six o'clock, that's even better. If it doesn't get that six hours of sun, it'll struggle a little bit. It'll start to thin out. Uh, Bermuda, spreads by runners, above ground runners, that are quite aggressive and they'll grow three to six to eight inches a year, depending upon uh, healthy and good your soil is and your fertilizing. It has high drought and wear tolerance. Uh, your kids can play on it, it's gonna hurt it. Uh, you mow it at one and a half to two inches high, it does, uh, I'm, I mow it at uh, two inches high in the summertime when it's really, really hot and a little bit drier. And we always fertilize starting in May, uh, an optional fertilizing in June if you want to, and then definitely again in July. Now, I'm gonna go back to the previous slide just for a minute where we see that growth spur. The first fertilizing is in May, and we do that because that's when it wants to grow. If you fertilize it in February or March or even early April, early April, it isn't really ready to accept that fertilizer yet. So the key point here is we fertilize the grass when the grass wants it. And then as, it, as it's starting to slow down in September and October, we don't fertilize it because, because we don't want to uh, incent growth at that time. So fertilize in May, you optionally fertilize in June again. In July, you can fertilize definitely, and then optionally in August. There's another variety of hybrid Bermuda that came out about 12 years ago, and it's called Tiff Brand. And the 
most people aren't aware of this. TIF Grand, however, was developed to handle a little bit of shade. So whereas Tiffway needs at least six hours of sun a day, TIF Grand can get along with five hours of sun a day. But again, most of that has got to be the hot afternoon sun. Uh, it's been available since 2009. It's not quite as aggressive and fast growing as Tiffway. Uh, it needs a little less water and fertilizer. You mow it at the same height and you fertilize it again the first time in May. You can do it in June, but you definitely fertilize it again in July. Uh, I mentioned this, this uh, type of, of Bermuda because some of you may find, if you have a Bermuda lawn, that at the edges of your lawn where trees may be growing taller and spreading out more and more, there may be more shade on your Bermuda at the edges uh, than it had had five, 10 years ago. And so if it's thinning out enough and yet you still want to have Bermuda lawn there, you, you could buy some sod at, at Pikes or other places and ju just fill in these areas uh, with TIF grand. Uh, and then the TIF way and your major part of your lawn and TIF grand will sort of combine together. And in a year, year or two, they will look identical and you'll have a happier lawn. The other warm season grass is zoysia. And I have zoysia on my lawn. Uh, zoysia also prefers full sun, uh, just like Bermuda. There are three major varieties. Meyer, which is the most common variety. Uh, Zeon, which has a thinner blade than Meyer. And its virtue it, is it handles a little bit of shade, uh, like Tifway, but not a lot of shade. And the third variety is Emerald. Uh, Emerald has been around for longer than Zeon. It looks very, very much like Zeon, not quite as strong, but it's a perfectly, perfectly good, fine grass. Again, zoysia also grows by runners, but the runners are a little slower growing than Bermuda. Uh, one, of, one of the interesting parts about a zoysia lawn is it can become very, very, very dense. And if you were to walk on it in your bare feet in the summertime, it almost, almost feels like you're uh, on a walking on a thick plush carpet. It's just very, very soft and very kind to your feet. Uh, we mow it just a little bit higher than uh, Bermuda, uh, two and a half, two inches in the uh, spring and in the fall, and two and a half inches in the heat of the summer. And again, fertilize again in May, not before May, optionally in late June, and then again in August, but not after August. Now, the other type of grass, cool season grasses, the grasses that stay green all year long. And in North Georgia, that's mainly tall fescue. There is some bluegrass here, but almost everybody has tall fescue because tall fescue is just a hardier, healthier grass than bluegrass in this area. Uh, Cool season grasses love temperatures between 60 degrees and 85 degrees. Uh, so that's why in, in March and April, when we start getting to 60 degree temperatures, that's when our cool season grasses really start to grow rapidly. And once the temperature reaches 85 in the, uh, uh, in the late May, June timeframe, uh, Tall fescue doesn't really like that all that much, so it will slow down, and we, we don't have to mow the lawn quite as much in the summertime as we did during the growth period. The nice part about fescue is that it stays green all year long, and that's, that's nice. It grows in both the northern and southern parts of the United States. We normally establish it using seed, but the one drawback to cool season grasses, they are not drought tolerant. So, so you need to give them that one inch of water every week. If we look at the growth cycle for uh, cool season grasses, 
you you'll see that they are not they're not dormant in the winter time. They're growing very 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 slowly, but usually so slowly you don't have to worry about mowing them. Uh, starting it in March as that weather warms up, the grass perks up. By the beginning of April, it, it's in uh, uh, it's really growing rapidly. Uh, you definitely have to uh, have to mow it at least once a week at this time. Some some sometimes a little more frequently. And that growth continues until the middle of June when the weather starts warming up too much for it and it slows down. Not as much as it was in the winter time, but it, but it slows down nonetheless. Then beginning in the end of August, beginning of September, as it notices the temperatures cooling, it starts growing again. It's actively growing until the uh, middle of November when it starts to taper off and then goes in, into its slow winter season. The predominant variety, as I said, is tall fescue. It, and in, in our climate, with the intensity of the heat that we get here in the summertime, tall fescue likes morning sun and afternoon shade. If you plant it where there is afternoon sun, it is going to struggle. Fescue, fescue, as well as bluegrass, gets under stress when the temperature exceeds 85 degrees. So you would like it to be in shade at that time of the day. It does need regular water, one inch per week, so that if you don't have an irrigation system or you can't easily water your lawn on a regular basis, uh, you're going to have a tough time with fescue uh, surviving. The other characteristic of fescue <clears throat> is that it does not spread. It starts as a seed. It, it stays as a single plant. There are no underground rhizomes or runners at all. It's just one single plant that doesn't multiply. So the, the summer heat will normally kill some of those uh, fescue plants. And given that, and it's normal for that to happen, you usually need to overseed every September, which is not a hard thing to do. Tall fescue, we mow it at a higher height, uh, two and a half inches in the spring and in the fall. We raise that to three and a half inches in the summertime what, 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 once the heat really starts to get to it. Uh, we fertilize earlier than we do the warm season grasses. The grass starts growing in March, so that's when we fertilize it the first time. Uh, we can optionally give it another dose in May, but we don't fertilize after May until September. And in September, we definitely want to fertilize it again. And you can optionally give it a little more in November. So if we look at the major differences summarized on, on, on this slide for the two different types of grasses, you can vividly see that the they like different temperatures to grow actively. They want different sunlight. Uh, while they both like an inch of water a week, uh, the Bermuda grass and, uh, and the zoysia can hit a little, little less than that. We mow them at different heights and we fertilize them at totally different times of the year. The best thing that you can do for your lawn is to conduct the soil test, have a soil test made. Uh, the reason for this is that we put fertilizer on, on, on our lawns several times each year. And that fertilizer can only be absorbed by the roots effectively when the pH of the soil, the that's a measure of the acidity and the alkalinity of the soil is between five and a half and six and a half. If we're outside of those ranges, you can put fertilizer on your lawn, but a good deal of it just can't be absorbed by the grass's roots. And in North Georgia, our soil is frequently too acid and it gets a little more acid every year. It doesn't fall off a cliff, but 
your pH might be 6.0 one year, then the next year it, uh, it, it reduces to 5.8, 5.7, and it goes down a little more the next year. After a while, everybody's lawn will become too acid. Yours may or may not be right now. So the way, way you have a soil test done is you go out onto your lawn and you collect eight to 12 samples, about two to four inches deep. Uh, I use a narrow trowel, which I plunge into the ground uh, to create a square type core that I can dig out of the ground. And I, I take that core, that core sample out of the ground. I take some of the dirt off the bottom of that core. And then I just put the core back in the, in the ground where I got it from. And I do this enough times randomly around the lawn. So I get at least one and a half cups of soil because the uh, uh, UGA needs one and a half cups worth of soil in order to conduct the, the, te the test satisfactorily. Uh, the hardest part about doing a soil test is getting the sample to your county extension office. And in, uh, in North Fulton area, that, that means uh, getting in your car and taking it down to the uh, extension office, which is in Sandy Springs on Roswell Road at the North Fulton Service Center. Uh, the cost is $12 per sample, which you can pay by check, Visa, MasterCard, or money order. Um, if, if it's not convenient to uh, take that sample down to the extension office, uh, you, you can order it online at the, uh, at the website shown here. It costs $15. Uh, they'll send a container to you and you send you, your soil sample back in. If you can take it down to the extension office, the whole process is, is a little bit quicker. And what you find is the results will be emailed back in two weeks. They'll tell you what the pH of your soil is and what your other major uh, nutrients measure out as. And they'll give you recommendations right in the report as to what to do to correct your lawn. In, in, in most cases, if you need to make a correction, it will be to raise the pH of the lawn, which means you spread dolomitic lime onto your lawn, usually using a broadcast spreader, which we're showing here. Uh, just follow the directions on the bag as well as in your soil test report of how much to put on. And lime doesn't change the pH immediately. It takes about six months to have a full effect. So it's really, really, really useful to do a soil test uh, early to mid fall, which means if you do have to make a correction in, in adding lime, you can do it in the October, November time frame, and over the next six months, it gets down in the soil, it reacts with the soil, so it has full effect by the time we get to the spring. Uh, Mary, we're just about at our half point time right now. Uh, do we have any questions? We sure do, we've got a few of them, John. Um, here's the first one. My new Xeon Zoysia sod was put down at the end of May. The landscaper that put it down said, do not lime or fertilizer this year. My lawn care person says that it's well rooted and should get lime and a little bit of fertilizer um, to get it through the fall until going dormant. Right now, it's a little bit light green. Which do you think is the correct direction? Well, first of all, right now <clears throat> is not a particularly good time to add fertilizer. Since... Uh, yeah, you know, we're right in the beginning of September and the, the grass really does want to slow down uh, as, as its normal health pattern that we showed. Uh, as far as lime is concerned, uh, what you could do is to conduct this, have this soil test that, that I just talked about. Uh, lime is something you don't have to add immediately. As I said, it takes four to six months for it take effect, take effect. So get a soil test, take it down to your county extension. Uh, and then literally in two weeks, you'll have the results and then you'll know whether you need to add lime or not. Okay. 
Mary? Perfect. All right, the next one. Um, I'm new to this first time home buyer. How do I even know what type of grass that I have? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, it, it should be easy to tell over the next uh, three, four months, whether you have a warm season grass or a cool season grass, mm -hmm. whether you have tall fescue or whether you have Bermuda or Zoysia. Um, if you, because one will turn dormant and the other won't. Uh, the way I just try to distinguish between Bermuda and Zoysia is that Bermuda grass is, is a little stiff. It's a little prickly. So that when you put your hand on it or, or walk on it, it, it doesn't hurt you. It's not prickly to that extent, but, it, but it's a stiffer grass blade. Um, and, and it's a little more blue green in color than zoysia. Uh, zoysia grass, uh, as I said earlier, when you walk on it, it's like you're walking on a plush carpet. It's just nice and soft. So to me, those are the major characteristics. If you're really, uh, if you're still puzzled after all that, you could just uh, cut out a little sample of your grass and you could either take it to, to Pikes or take it to the extension office and they could tell you there. Okay. Mary? Um, when should I re reseed tall fescue and zone 7B this year? We'll be getting into that shortly. Gotcha. All right, um, take a couple more and then keep going. I have zoysia growing in my backyard. There's a shaded part that has a hard time growing. Would you advise trying tall fescue in that area to see if that could work? The area does get some morning sun and I do have an irrigation system. Uh, you, Mary, would you repeat that question for me once more? Okay, um, I have zoysia growing in my backyard. There is a shaded part that has a hard time growing. Would you advise trying tall fescue in that area to see if it would work? It gets some morning sun. Uh, generally speaking, uh, warm season grass right immediately next to uh, fescue uh, just doesn't look good. Mm -hmm. um, You've got a difference in, in sunlight conditions there, with, which I guess it is causing that, that problem. And frankly, what, what I would do if I were you, uh, uh, rather than planting fescue there, uh, I would plant, uh, well, I'd do one of two things. I'd either put in a, a shrubbery bed uh, or just put mulch in that area, which can be attractive. Uh, or you could uh, you could conceivably plant dwarf mondo grass, uh, which handles shade well. But I'm a gardener, so I, uh, when when an air, area is a little too shady for grass, I say, why don't you put some shrubs in there and make the area look nice, or some ground cover. Gotcha. All right, let me ask one more and then uh, we'll catch the last up, the rest of them at the end. Is there a particular type of mower depending on warm season or cool season grasses? There really isn't. Uh, some people seem to, to think there is. Uh, there isn't. Uh, I, use a, I use a gas driven rotary mower uh, and, and, it, and it does fine. So, I mean, if you've got a real mower and real type mower and you want to put up with that, you can. Uh, in fact, I've got a mulching um, uh, rotary mower and it does a great, great job because it makes the clippings very, very small. Uh, but you can use any mower you have. Okay. All right. All right. Okay, let's go on with the presentation then. Now we're gonna talk about fertilizer. The reason we need to fertilize our lawns several times throughout the year is because we keep mowing them. If we didn't mow them, we wouldn't be forcing them to continue to, to do new growth and therefore we wouldn't have to fertilize very much. But because our lawns really look nice when they're mowed, 
uh, we like that effect. Uh, all fertilizers are measured by, all lawn fertilizers are measured by their three key ingredients, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, because plants need, these are the major, major ingredients that plants need to be healthy. Uh, our normal synthetic chemical lawn fertilizer that's been around for decades and decades and decades is for lawns, it's high in nitrogen because nitrogen contributes to the green grass growth that we see. Uh, it used to have phosphorus in it, but it no longer has phosphorus in it because that would get into our streams and lakes and that's not good for the streams and lakes. So our, our normal, our lawn fertilizers now have no phosphorus in them. And uh, it has some potassium. Uh, potassium is good for the overall health of the plant. So a typical uh, lawn fertilizer will be 32% uh, nitrogen, 0% uh, phosphorus, and 10% potassium. Starter fertilizers, which are used for starting new or overseeded lawns, are different. They've got a moderate amount of nitrogen, a high level of phosphorus, because ph phosphorus uh, is good for root growth. And when you're starting a seed, you want that root growth uh, and have some potassium in them. So an example of a starter fertilizer is 18, 24, 12. And you can compare that to the 32, zero and 10, 10 with your normal lawn fertilizer. And you can see there's quite a difference. Uh, it, it, if your soil test were to come back and it shows that you're low in phosphorus on your lawn. The way to raise the phosphorus level is to apply a starter fertilizer on it because that does have some phosphorus in it. Uh, the third type of fertilizer, and this is really only within the last oh, 10, 15 years, is organic lawn, lawn fertilizer. Uh, uh, Chemical fertilizers are still the most common to find, but there are some really good aspects to an organic lawn fertilizer that I'll be talking to you on the next, next slide. Organic fertilizers are, have a mod, moderate nitrogen level, a low potassium level, excuse me, a low phosphorus level and a low potassium level. So an example would be 11, two and two. And while you notice that the nitrogen level is lower in an organic fertilizer, we compensate for that lowness by putting more fertilizer on the lawn. And all three of these we normally put on with a broadcast spreader. Uh, uh, drop spreaders just do a, a little bit at a time, a little width at a time, whereas a broadcast spreader is much more efficient uh, and makes it faster and easier to do. Now, chemical versus organic fertilizer, which should you use? Well, the chemical fertilizer that have been around for a long time, they're definitely less expensive. Uh, they also release nitrogen faster uh, than organics do. The downside, and th this is something that we've really only realized over the last 10 to 15 years, is that chemical fertilizers leave chemical salts in the ground, in the soil, and these chemical salts hoil, uh, harm <laughs> soil organisms, the microbes, the worm, the insects that are in the soil. And this is, this is the, uh, you know, the, uh, the healthy parts of, uh, of what, what's going on in the soil, many of which we don't even, can't even see because they're microscopic. So to have a healthier lawn, you might consider an organic fertilizer. Uh, I did myself. Uh, uh, I've got a Xeon lawn that I put in in 2009 and it was doing beautifully, but there's one section of it that gets a little more a uh, little more shade and it was starting to thin out. 
I, I really thought it was getting enough sun. Uh, so what I decided to do is to try an organic fertilizer just on that one area. And what I found is that within six months, the lawn was starting to fill in. And a, a year later, it had totally filled in. So for me, going to an organic fertilizer uh, really, really uh, made my lawn better. As I said previously, it has a lower nitrogen percentage. So you, you add more, you just follow the instructions on the bag. Uh, it does promote the growth of organisms that are beneficial to the soil. Uh, you know, the mantra of organic gardening is feed the soil, which then feeds the plant. And that's what this does. And what you get is a slower, longer release of nitrogen into the, into the plant roots rather, rather than something that is very, very fast. Watering. All, gra all grasses want one inch of water per week. But Bermuda grass and zoysia can survive with less. Uh, when we had our drought in, I forget whether that's 2008 or 2009, and we couldn't really water, water at all, uh, our, our warm season grasses survived. They, they weren't as healthy as they were before, but they made it. Uh, the key to watering is to water deeply and not frequently. You don't want to water every day. You don't want to water every other day. The whole objective is to get water deep into the ground, four to six inches deep into the ground, to force the roots to grow deep into the soil to get the water. So you want to water once or twice a week and not more than that. The best times to water is between eight o'clock at night and 10 o'clock in the morning. And, and while many of you think that uh, that's uh, so we don't get uh, uh, so we don't get evaporation, well, that, that's part of the reason. But the real reason is that your lawn, my lawn, everybody's lawn has fungus spores in the soil that are, that are just waiting to develop. They're waiting for the right conditions. And the right condition for these fungus spores is 13 to 15 hours of wetness on the blade of grass. So what, so what we want, what we, what we don't want is to have grass wet for prolonged periods of time. Now, obviously, if it's raining out, there's nothing we can do about that. But, but if it's anything that we can control ourselves, we, we try to do it. So the, and the best time to really water your lawn is between 3 a.m. and 7 a.m. The grass blades are wet until the sun comes up at eight or nine o'clock in the morning. And then, then the grass will be dry, the, the blades themselves will be dry by, by 10 or 11. So in this way, uh, you get your water that you need, you get it deeply by doing it only once or twice a week. And, and you minimize the likelihood of fungus growth. There are some winter weeds that we do get, henbit, chickweed, a few others. Uh, but the prominent weed that we really get, it is very, very difficult, can be difficult to get rid of, is annual bluegrass, which is also called poa annua. And you'll here it commonly referred to on, on both names. Uh, Poa annua germinates during the fall and the early to mid winter. Uh, you really won't see it, however, until January sometime. And, and you'll see a picture there on the top of the slide of what it begins to look like when, it, when it's totally mature. Uh, as a nice bright green color, it really looks happy and healthy. Uh, by the time we get into late May and June, this plant will die. But as you notice, the number of seeds on that plant, uh, the seed heads on it, uh, each, each, each plant will have hundreds and hundreds 
of of seed seeds on it, which voila are going to are going to uh, go into your soil. So it's a prolific seed producer. The only way, the only practical way to get rid of poa anoa, it is to apply a pre-emergent weed preventer at the right time. And the right time around here happens to be mid-September and then again in mid-December. So if you have, particularly if you have a warm season lawn and you notice the green growth, you have noticed green growth in the wintertime, I guarantee you, particularly if that green growth has seed heads growing out of it, that's annual bluegrass. And it is uh, it, it becomes a real scourge because it multiplies so much. So the way to get rid of that, as up as well as other uh, winter weeds, is using pre-emergent weed preventers, and these are also called crabgrass preventers. They're the same thing. Uh, you you can use a crab crabgrass preventer, which you would normally use in. Uh, March or in June, it, and you can also use that in, in September because they both do the same thing. The thing about these pre-emergence is they only work for two to three months. So when you put it down, put it, to, uh, put it down at the right time, and then three months later, you put it down again. There are certain pre-emergence that are, that, that that, come, um, that have nitrogen fertilizer already in it. However, I would highly recommend you do not use those because what you'll find in looking at your, at your lawn calendar, which is part of your handout, uh, fertilizer and pre-emergence are normally not applied at the same time. They are applied at different times. So you wanna have one bag of fertilizer and another bag of, of pre-emergent Put them on at separate times. Uh, an example of uh, a product, a pre-emergent that you can get, for example, at Home Depot, is a product called Lesco 007 uh, Pre-M. That's the name of it. It's called 007. They consider it a fertilizer because it has 7% potassium in it. But the key is it has no nitrogen in it. And nitrogen is the one thing you want to apply separately from pre-emergent. Uh, these pre-emergents are uh, granular products. You can get them at Home Depot, Lowe's, Pikes, garden centers. Uh, and there are many different products out there and, and there are many different act, active ingredients that they use. If any of you have been using uh, pre-emergence on your lawn and have found that they don't control uh, poa anua well, and that's what I found. Uh, I, was, I was following my, my advice rigorously, and yet, uh, as it turns out, there, there are different varieties of poa anua, and some of them just need need a really, really, really strong pre-emergent, pre which most of us don't have access to. Uh, there are products that are applied by lawn professionals. And uh, last fall, I had a professional put down a pro pr product that contained an active ingredient called indazaflam, and it did a wonderful job of, of uh, uh, getting rid of all of my poa anua. And I had one area that was just terrible. Uh, so if any of you need more information or some guidance to uh, uh, lawn professionals to go to, uh, just put it in as a, as a question and we'll uh, try to get the information back to you. Uh, so that's pre-emergence. So now let's go over what, what the various fall and winter tasks are that, that you're going to have to, uh, have to uh, look after. If you've got Bermuda grass or zoysia, it's really easy for you at this time of year. Uh, 
in mid-September, put down pre-emergent uh, for annual bluegrass as well as other winter weeds. Uh, do not aerate your lawn anymore until next summer. Uh, in the late November or mid-December timeframe, you can put down pre-emergent again. Uh, do a soil test to see if lime needs to be added. And then starting in the February, March timeframe is when you'll apply pre-emergent weed preventer for not, not only some poa anua that might still come up and germinate, but also cr mainly crabgrass and spring weeds at that point. So the main task for you, for you people that have a, a warm season grass is to not do much because you don't need to do much. No fertilizing, nada. However, for tall fescue, this is the one time of year when you really do need to spend time on your lawn. Uh, spring is not a good time to plant fescue seed. The difficulty is, the problem is that when you plant fescue seed in the spring, it doesn't have much time for the roots to get established before the heat of summer. They're, they're still immature growing roots in June and July. And that summer heat just uh, bakes them. And a lot of what you've done planting, planting that seed in the March, April timeframe is just gonna be to waste. The only time to overseed or to plant uh, fescue seed is really in September to mid-October in this area. Uh, you have to prepare the soil a little bit uh, before seeding. You don't just buy some seed and throw it out on the grass. Uh, if you do that, that, some of it will take, but not much. You want to start by mowing your lawn uh, fairly low, one and a half to two inches. It is good to rough up the soil somewhat. And the easiest way to do that, unless you, unless you have a very, very, very small patch of fescue lawn where you could use a hard rake to do that same thing. But the best way, if, if you have a fairly large area, is to rent a core aerator, uh, which is a gas-driven, very, very heavy machine. So unless you're fairly strong or have a strong teenage son, if I were you, I would hire an outside service to come in and do th this part of it for you. They don't cost that much money. They really don't. Um, what a core aerator does, it, it's got a revolving drum that just plucks cores of soil out of the ground and just leaves them on the top of the soil. And it leaves openings, therefore, in the soil. So what, once you've done... Once you've scratched the soil or had it aerated, now you're going to spread some topsoil or a topsoil sandy mix in it or level any areas out. Uh, if you quarry it or air, aerated, you'll probably want to take a hard rake at this point and just pound those, those cores and break them apart a little bit. Uh, you'll then add your uh, uh, starter fertilizer. Make sure that everything is at the uh, level and the gradation that you want, and then broadcast seed on the ground. Uh, during germination, and that's usually about two weeks, you need to keep the soil moist. So you do that by watering briefly, one to two times a day, no more than a quarter of an inch either time. You're not trying to make the soil wet, you're just trying to keep it moist. Uh, and you will gradually then taper off. You will gradually then taper off as, the, as you see the, uh, the, the blades of grass developing. Uh, make it uh, once a day and then every two days and then every three days, and then you're on to a normal schedule at that point. Excuse me. Um, you will, if you have overseeded, if you don't need to overseed, then you can apply a pre-emergent as well as fertilizer. 
But if you have overseeded, do not apply a pre-emergent. You gotta wait until February for your pre-emergent to be applied. Uh, in November, you'll have an optional uh, second fall fertilizing. Again, do a soil test to see if you need to, need to apply lime. Uh, add your second pre-emergent if you did not overseed uh, in December. And then starting in February, again, pre-emergent for crabgrass and spring weeds, as well as fertilize in March. You may find that your fescue lawn, if you should find that your fescue lawn really, really needs to be done over, uh, which is not an easy task, but I'll go over with you what it is because you, you can do it yourself if you've got enough time for it. What you need to do is to remove, well, and let me say, 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 say this, a lot of lawn professionals advised that if your lawn is, is half weeds and less than half grass, or if you, your fescue is so sparse that you see more dirt than you see grass, it might be well worth it to establish a totally new fescue lawn. So the way you go about doing that is remove or kill all the existing uh, grass and weeds. Uh, you can use ground up, you could use another, another uh, grass killer out there. Uh, you could skim the stuff off, but you wanna get rid of that material that, unless you mow it real, 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 real well. You're then gonna till your soil to five in inches deep with a rototiller. What, you, what, you, what you're gonna be doing is preparing that soil so that it has enough organic matter in it that the, uh, that the seeds roots really want to grow down in it. And you'll have a seed bed there, a soil bed that is really, really good for the fescue. So till it down to about five, five inches deep, which is what a rototiller does. Add one inch to four inches of organic matter, at least one inch. Uh, you don't have to add more than that, but the, the more you do add, the better it will be. Lawns don't need to have a lot of organic matter, unlike uh, perennial beds. Uh, you'll then spread your starter fertilizer and lime if you need it. And then till that all in again to make sure it's all combined very, very well. Uh, you then want to rake the soil to level it. You're gonna wanna tamp it down. Uh, not stomp on it, you're just tamping it down so it gets to its normal level. Uh, you, can, uh, you can rent a roller if you want for that, or you can just uh, tamp it down with the, with the soil of your feet, whatever works for you. Uh, and, then, and then after you've done that, you're gonna rake it lightly and regrade it because you'll, you'll find some ups and downs when you do that. Uh, but have a nice level, nice gradation at that point. And at this point, you uh, spread your seed. You just lightly, lightly rake that seed in with a hard rake. You're not trying to get it deep. You're trying to get, get it an eighth of an inch, at most a quarter of an inch deep. And then apply straw, straw mulch lightly over the soil, which will help to conserve moisture, as well as hope, hopefully uh, keep some of the crows away from from eating your seed before it germinates. At this point, you have to go through the same procedure we did with overseeding. You're gonna water lightly twice a day until the seed germinates. Uh, for the next week after that, water once per day for about 15 minutes. For the next week, you water every other day. And at that point, you can get on a regular watering schedule. You'll first mow the grass when the grass, it exceeds two inches, and you apply regular fertilizer after your second full mowing. So that's what we do for establishing a new lawn. As a recap of everything we're talking about, please get your soil tested. It really is easy to do. It doesn't cost much money. Uh, if you've got different types of grass in different parts of your property, or, or if, you're, 
You have the same grass, but it's growing differently in different areas of your property. Uh, take more than one sample. Uh, continue watering one inch a week while your grass is growing. In the wintertime, your grass isn't growing no matter what type of grass you have. And we get plenty of rain here, generally in the wintertime anyway. For Bermuda and Zoysia, apply your pre-emergent now, but do not fertilize or aerate at this time. Wait until next year. Uh, for tall fescue, overseed if your grass has thinned and use a starter fertilizer with it. Uh, if you aren't overseeding, you can fertilize and then apply pre-emergent. Then you can fertilize again in November if you want to. Uh, apply pre-emergent in December if you haven't overseeded. So, if you have any further questions, there are various resources you can take advantage of. In North Fulton County, uh, we have a helpline that you can use for questions about your lawn or any gardening question you have, whether it's trees, shrubs, vegetables, perennials, anything at all. You can call this helpline. There's no charge for it. Uh, if, if there's someone there at the time to answer your question, they will, and it'll, it'll be a master gardener like me. Uh, or if there's no one there, you leave a message and someone will call you back. There are a lot of publications on the UGA website that you can access at no charge that really, really are very, very helpful. And most of the, most of the, many of them, I should say, are intended for homeowners. So take advantage of them. Uh, obviously, we can utilize Google to search for any of you, any, uh, any answers you want, but just be very, very careful and make sure you get the and same answer from two different sources. And finally, we, we do have a series of classes and I'll go over them a little bit later, but you, you can always, always access what our, what our uh, homeowner classes are by going to nfmg.net and looking at the community classes session. As we wrap this up and before we take, take more, more questions, I would like to thank some of our partners. We have promotional partners listed here, which do a wonderful job of sending out information on our programs and helping us put on, put on programs like these. Uh, we also have media partners, uh, AJC, WABE, a lot of the Herald newspapers, several of them that you see here that are also very, very, very useful and helpful to us. And, and we applaud them and thank them. Uh, now, Mary, uh, do we have any more questions? Yes, sir. Um, I tried to combine them down into ones that are similar. So we've got about 15 to go through. The first one strikes close to home for me. Is there anything that will keep dog urine from killing emerald zoysia or any kind of grass? Yeah, it's really no, it's really no dip, different what type of grass you have. Um, <clears throat> There's, there, there's no sure proof way to do it. Uh, uh, obviously, if you can, uh, if, if you are with the dog at the time and then can wet that area with water afterwards to dilute it, it, it will help out. Um, and there are products on the market that uh, make it a little bit better. But if you've got a female dog, it, it's gonna happen. It, it's, one, it's one of the penalties Penalties we uh, pay as, as dog lovers, unfortunately. Um, commenting for a friend is not just female dogs. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I got a little guy and he does the same thing. Um, okay, do the roots of turf grasses interact with mycorrhizae as tree and plant roots do? Uh, uh, would you I, my cor I, do the roots of turf grasses interact with I'm going to butcher this, mycorrhizae, um, the, the white good fungus that um, help the root systems as tree and plant roots do. Well, I would assume the uh, what, what, you're, what I think you're referring to, 
it is those microorganisms <clears throat> that mm -hmm. are in the soil and that help uh, break down organic yeah. matter and other th things that uh, that really lead to more food for the plant to absorb. And sure, they, they uh, the roots of the grasses don't get in the way of that at all. No, it, 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 it's, the, it's, it, it's the web of life down there. A root to root. Okay, mm -hmm. um, we had Bermuda sod put down last fall in a new house. There were two installations in which the landscaper said were, were from the same farm, but they have two distinct, distinct differing colors. They must be two different batches. Is there anything to do to get the colors to blend together better? I'm really surprised to hear that. Um, if he was using, and, and you, could, <clears throat> you, you could ask your, your landscaper this, uh, if he was using uh, Tiff Grand, which, which is that it's the most common hybrid Bermuda out there. Uh, it should be the same color. Uh, that, that other variety that I mentioned to you, Tiff Way, is a little, little different, but not much. Uh, my, my suspicion is maybe he didn't give you a Tiff Grand on both parts of your property, but I, I would ask him about that. Why, are, why is the color different? Because I don't see any explanation for it, okay. any good explanation. Um, we have a case of army worms. Any advice on that? It's interesting that you asked that question uh, this year. Um, We seem to be having a little bit of a problem this summer with what's called fall army worms. Uh, these, these army worms aren't, aren't native to Georgia. Uh, they're native to Florida and they get blown up here by the, by the breezes. Uh, and generally speaking, we don't have much of a problem with fall army worms. Unfortunately, this summer has been hot and it's been wetter than normal. And that's what these fall army worms really like. Um, there, are, there are killers out there. There, there are insecticides that, that you can buy to, uh, to kill them. But the, the fall army worms, from what I've been able to read, uh, they act pretty quickly so that once you notice some damage, if, if, it, if it's in a large area, you, you have to work very, very quickly yourselves. So uh, this is, I've noticed some problem with that this year, but in a, in a normal summer, we don't find much of a problem with them. And, and, and there are, uh, once you start seeing them crawling across your, your driveway or something like that, and if you notice any damage on your, your lawn, you can go, go to your big box stores as well as Pikes. And there are insecticides that you can buy for them. Okay. What is the shade tolerance of Tiff Tough Bermuda? Well, I... <laughs> um, that's a variety of Bermuda that I have heard of, but is not one of the common, common, common hybrid Bermuda varieties that we deal with. Uh, let me just give you a little background on this. These, the two hybrid Bermudas that I've talked about were developed by the University of Georgia uh, Horticultural Department. Uh, and they are very, very, very strong industrial strength Bermudas. They, they do a wonderful job. Uh, uh, they have sterile seeds uh, so that uh, even though you see seed heads on them, they, they don't reseed, which, which is good. You don't, you don't want Bermuda reseeding. 
that, that there are some other forms of Bermuda out there, and maybe this Tiff Tuff is one of them. But unfortunately, it's something that I'm not familiar with. And you'd really have to go to the internet and get some information on it. Okay. All right, the next one. I have a tall fescue lawn. It's unusually brown this year. Um, it does get a lot of sun. Will water help at this point, or should I just overseed and hope for the best? I, I would I would definitely overseed, but keep in mind if if you've been watering it reasonably because you, you 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 don't want to water overwater things as well and we, we've gotten a lot of a lot of rain this fall this this summer uh but if it's been getting enough rain enough water uh and, and it's and a lot of it is is turning brown then maybe it's getting too much sun and if it's getting too much sun there's just not a whole lot you can do about it now, maybe you should have a warm season grass there, or maybe you should just put in a, a shrubbery bed or a flower bed or uh, or a ground cover of some type, which would be right. able to handle the sunlight and the heat better. Right, that's but, what but, we're saying. But, but you could certainly overseed and, and see what happens. And see what happens. Right plant, right place. Yep. Um, I need to have my yard regraded to correct some improper drainage. When is the best time to do this um, as grass will be replanted and asking for recommendations as a southern exposure but get shade from uh, neighbors' trees and retaining walls? Yeah, it really depends on the type of grass you have. I mean, if you've got a cool, if you've got tall fescue, then the time to do it is now because this is the time. This is the only time of the year to plant tall fescue, really and truly. If you've got Bermuda or Zoysia, then I would then I would do that in the uh, April, May, June time frame, because that you you really want to plant Bermuda and Zoysia in May and June and July, because that's when it's actively growing. That's when it's alive. That's when it's perking up when its roots want to grow and when the grass wants to grow. Okay. Can you tell us some brands of organic fertilizers that you like to use for grass in general and then particularly for zoysia? Well, I use, there, there, there are different products out there. And if you were go, if you were to go to uh, to pikes in particular, you you would see one one or two varieties there, and I, I'm not, I just don't recall at this point what they are. I use a product from Scotts called, called Scotts Natural. It used up until about three years ago. It was available at Home Depots, but I guess they didn't sell enough of it, uh, uh, so they no longer stock it. At, at least least in the Atlanta area stores that I've seen. However, uh, you can order it online from, uh, from Scott's. Uh, I just go on to Amazon and then put in Scott's natural and it, 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 it ta takes me to, uh, I think it's a, I think it's a Scott's website, but they'll deliver it right to you. It didn't, doesn't cost any more money than I picked it up at Home Depot myself and I, I don't have, have to have it uh, pick it up. I have it delivered to me. So that's what I do. Even better. But but Scott's isn't the only one out there that has it, believe me. Okay. What works well to kill nut sedge, burrweed, and doveweed? Do you have anything in particular you can recommend for those? What are the three three weeds? Nut sedge burrweed and doveweed. Okay, I'm not familiar with burrweed and doveweed. Mm -hmm. So you'd, you'd really have to just take a look at, uh, you know, do a, a Google search or, or go to Home Depot or Lowe's or uh, uh, Pikes or any other garden center and look at uh, look at what, what might eradicate those. 
Uh, nuts edge is, uh, is an interesting weed <clears throat> because uh, you can't pull it out of the ground. I mean, you can, but it doesn't do any good. Uh, there are two different things you can do about nut sedge. Uh, if you've got a lot of it, uh, there are nut sedge killers out there that are selective. In other words, they only kill nut sedge. They don't affect your grass. Um, and so it, it's, it's expensive, it's not cheap, but it does selectively kill nut sedge. If you don't have a lot of nut sedge, what I would do, well, what I have done, what I do myself, because I, I, get, I get it once in a while at this point. I had a lot more of it at one point. But I just take, a, take Roundup and I, I put a little bit of it into a, into, a, into a glass bowl. I get a foam paintbrush. That's foam, F-O-A-M. They're very, very, very cheap paintbrushes. And what I, I dip the foam paintbrush into the Roundup, and then I carefully paint the, uh, the blades of, of the nut sedge leaves. Uh, and what you will find if you do this, uh, you might have to do it a week later, and then you might have to do a week after that. But uh, uh, that will just go right down to the roots and then the nutlets that are uh, three to four inches into the ground and it will kill most of them. Next year, you might get a couple of plants coming out and you do the same thing, but I guarantee you it worked wonderfully for me. And, and it's, a, it's an inexpensive, easy way to take care of it. Okay. Um, a couple of questions for recommendations on professionals to help with POA annual. Uh, one in Sandy Springs for non-grass areas and one for one to apply in Dazafam in Georgia. Well, uh, you, you, the, the lawn professional that I use, he actually <clears throat> gave uh, two applications. I, I, I have a small front yard. It's only 3,000 square feet. That's the only lawn I have. And he, he applied, applied it in uh, the middle of September, he gave it a half dose. And then the end of November, he gave another half dose and did, did a wonderful job. Okay. Mary, any more questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get my dog oh, to stop okay. barking. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, how do I get rid of fungus in a zoysia lawn? How do you get rid of fungus? Is that what you said? Yeah. Well, most there, there there are several common f funguses that can affect lawns. Most of them, most of them are not fatal, so you, you can generally ride them out, and they'll go away and you, you don't have to worry about it. There are uh, fungus killers out there, but they only work for a very, very short period of time. Uh, so, so while it may help your immediate problem, uh, it doesn't do anything beyond that. Uh, if you need to do some research on the type of fungus that you have, uh, you can certainly call your, your county extension, uh, or you, you can do some online checking of what these funguses look like for, uh, for how you should treat them, and then just follow the instructions that are given for that. But again, most funguses are not fatal. But there are one or two, however, that, that, that can cause some real damage. Mary? Okie doke. Um, here's one on soil testing. If I live in DeKalb County, can I use the North Fulton Extension Service or should I look for the DeKalb County Extension? I think, I think you, you can take it to uh, any county extension that, that is convenient for you. I don't think it matters. Okay. Um, 
Any tips on growing moss? Well, moss likes, uh, it likes shade. It likes dampness. It likes heavily compacted, bad, bad soil. So, <laughs> you know, that's uh, easy. <laughs> it, well, <laughs> I mean, it, it really, it's an opportunistic, it's an opportunistic plant that it grows where other th things generally don't want to grow. Okay. All right. That about does it. Okay. Well, we want to th thank you all for participating tonight. Um, I'm going to, whoops mentioned that, that uh, uh, on Sunday, September 12th, uh, George Sesney will be conducting a class on fall vegetable gardening. If you're into vegetables, uh, George does a terrific job. He's a great gardener and can answer, I'm sure, all of your questions. So if you're into, into gardening and you want to take advantage of what we do here, what we can do here in the fall and the winter, the, people in other parts of the United States can't do, tune in on that class. Uh, in addition, uh, you will be getting a, a follow-up email after this class uh, asking for any, any suggestions you might have. It'll also include the, uh, the handout in it. Uh, and we hope you can join us at all of our, any and all of our future classes. Thank you very much.